Right. Thank you, everyone, for being here with us. It's really a pleasure to see that the room is still so full after a very long and fruitful day uh, of our conference. Uh, we're now going to have our final discussion for the day before the, uh, the, the much-awaited keynote. Um, this session is titled, You Say You're the Media, Now Act Like One. So we do live in interesting times where from the traditional media, we have now many other actors, including uh, spacemen such as citizens' journalism and influencers, self-proclaimed media, and so on. So our question in this panel is, how can we ensure that all actors in our media system are responsible and accountable? And to conduct this session, this will be moderated by Susan Morgan. Uh, Susan has over 20 years of experience working in both the public and private sector. She worked for various organizations including the Global Network Initiative and Open Society Foundation and she is now a freelance consultant and a senior advisor to the UDIS Info Lab. Thank you. Thanks so much uh, Maria. And um, so in the past couple of years I think we've seen an awful lot of discussion and debate about the responsibility and accountability of social media platforms in spreading disinformation, just thinking particularly about the context of the Digital Services Act. Um, we've now got the recently published European Commission's European Media Freedom Act uh, proposals. Um, so I think now we're going to see a kind of shifting of attention, uh, really to look at the role of the media in the information ecosystem and the support that's needed for quality media. So in this session, we're going to um, look at how we make sure that different media actors uh, are responsible and accountable, what's needed and where we go from here. Uh, we've got three great panelists uh, to answer some questions. Uh, sitting immediately to my right is Rasmus Kleist Nielsen, who's director of the Reuters Institute for the Study of Journalism and a professor of political communication at the University of Oxford. Um, his research focuses on the changing role of news and media in our societies, and he's written extensively about journalism, digital media, the business of news, political communication, and other things. Um, he's provided expert advice uh, to both governments and media companies in several countries. Um, sitting next to him is uh, Lubos Kirklish. Um, he's chief executive of the Council for Media Services of Slovakia and chair of the European Platform of Regulatory Authorities. In 2018 and 2019, he was chair of the European Regulators Group for Audio Visual Media Services and currently leads their work on disinformation. And then at the uh, far end, we have uh, Christophe Delois. He's been Secretary General and Executive Director of Reporters Without Borders since 2012. He's also the chair of the Forum on Information Democracy, which is the implementation body of the Partnership on Information and Democracy, which has been signed by 47 countries. Um, prior to his time at RSF, he ran one of the leading French journalism schools. Um, so I'm delighted to welcome our panel. Um, and I'd like to start uh, by asking you, Christophe, um, from your perspective at Reporters Without Borders, um, so you're obviously operating in a multinational environment, um, you work with journalists, you work with other stakeholders uh, in the media sector. Given that experience that you have, um, could you tell us what is media and what are the criteria to define it? We'll start with a small question. Um, I do not like debates about words. I prefer debates about uh, realities or facts. But in fact, uh, the question is not um, what is the media, but what is journalism? So the media, all types of sources of content can be qualified as media. In my eyes, the question is more what is a journalistic media? And there are a lot of people who pretend to be journalistic media. A lot of whatever types are there political activists. Do they have another cause? Um, are there sometimes uh, an advertising agency, an agency that produce sponsored content, corrupted content, or even propaganda media? They say now, we are journalists, and we have to benefit from press freedom, and we have to enjoy the benefits of um, media outlets. So 
that's difficult. And that's even more difficult since uh, many actors in the field, even, I would say, legitimate actors, they say, it's easy to know what is the media. We are journalists. Everybody knows that we are journalists. They are not in the minds of the other people who say, are they really journalists or not? Or publishers. They say, oh, we are old actors. We've been in the market for long. We have brands. Everybody knows that we are media or journalistic media. But uh, if you are a government, if you are a digital platform, you do not know. You know that uh, some really well-known brands are journalistic media, but for other ones, you don't know. So there is clearly a need now to um, distinguish journalism from what is not journalism. If we want to defend journalists when their rights are violated, but also if we want just to support the sustainability of journalism in the future. And I have to say that uh, on behalf of the Forum on Information Democracy, uh, Rasmus did co-chair um, a working group, an international working group, um, about a new deal for journalism. But if you want a new deal for journalism, you have to know what journalism is to be ready to identify um, this and then to bring some benefit you prove that you, you exercise some responsibility. Great, thank you. And um, do you think transparency is important in relation to the media? In fact, the journalism is based on what? You cannot say that um, a newsroom is a journalistic one if there is no editor independence. There is no transparency. This is one of the criteria about, for instance, the owners. You cannot be anonymous. You cannot pretend to be a journalistic media if uh, there is no journalistic methodolog methodology implemented and if there is no compliance with ethics. And the question now is how do we secure, how do we verify that media outlets implement all of this? And that's why we have launched the Journalism Trust Initiative, which is based on a standard, an ISO type standard, which was developed by a large variety of stakeholders under the aegis of the Euro European Standardization Committee, so that then we can um, create a condition so that there is an assessment about the compliance with the basic standards of journalism, based on self-assessment and on the certification market. So this is an external audit mechanism. So that at the end, we can request from digital platforms, advertisers, philanthropists, governments or, or um, uh, independent authorities when there is a, a public funding of journalism, that they um, give some incentives to those who comply with uh, basic journalistic principles. So it's a way to implement um, the values of, of journalism, but in the current digital era where clearly we have to connect the way technology functions, the sustainability of media, and ethics and methodology. Because for the first time in the recent history of democracies, when I say recent, um, uh, since last um, um, century, uh, we have a, an ecosystem, an information ecosystem, where clearly there is a direct competition between different types of contents. Remorse, uh, people who sing and dance, uh, propaganda, advertising, etc., and journalism. And this is an unfair competition. If you just circulate remorse or manipulated information, you have a competitive advantage in front of journalism. So at the end, journalism could die. We have to reverse this logic and find a market solution which is not discretionary, which is scalable, um, based on principles, so that clearly we, we give in the public space an insufficient incentivization for um, trustworthy news and information, in fact, trustworthy news media outlets, not based on assessments of content, no influence on contents, but just on the processes that are implemented by the media entities. And, um, and, and do you have um, any thoughts on the position of some publishers um, against Article 6 in the um, EMFA on transparency of ownership and guarantees of editorial freedom. Mm. Any views on that? Uh, 
in fact, um, what we can understand is that probably this is, uh, first, as an organization, we do support the European Freedom Act. And, and we, we, we do consider that it can really be an historical step forward. Second, the Article 6 um, should clearly be improved. Uh, what we have to secure is editor independence. We have to prevent us from having conflicts of interest. The owners, the advertisers, all types of stakeholders, they cannot just use the media outlets to exercise their influence. So we have to find ways to implement editorial independence, which, does, which doesn't mean that all journalists should be independent and do what they want. Of course, there is a shared editorial responsibility. Uh, it has to be secured, uh, which does not even mean that um, newsrooms should be fully independent on all aspects from publishers. But regarding editorial independence, this is not journalism if we do not secure this. So uh, my opinion is that there should be an agreement from all types of stakeholders, are they journalist unions, publishers unions, and other types, and, and NGOs, on this basic principle. Great, thank you. Um, Rasmus, I'd like to um, turn to turn to you now. Um, you're obviously doing research um, on news media, um, so it's interesting to hear if you've if you've seen the media being caught in disinformation campaigns. And do you have any examples that you could share with us? Uh, thank you. I think maybe before I answer that question, it's important to state something explicitly that I think has been implicit or even questioned throughout the conversations today which is that one of the reasons that in a setting like this, where all of us are concerned about the various disinformation and misinformation problems our societies face, um, it's important, I think, to recognize at the same time that sometimes journalism and news media can become part of those problems, but also at a much more fundamental level, um, that it's not an after-dinner speech to state that journalism plays an important role in countering misinformation and making people more resilient to misinformation. That's not an opinion. That's a set of scientific findings that we have for the last 30 years or more, um, that people paying attention to news produced by professional journalists working for news media, whether they are digital-born entrants like El Diario in Spain or legacy newspapers or broadcasters or public service media, it demonstrably uh, leads to them being more informed. It demonstrably helped them acquire more political knowledge it has demonstrably, during the pandemic, uh, helped people be more informed about coronavirus as disease, more likely to follow public health expert advice. Uh, um, so it, it, I think it's important just to sort of keep that front and center, that the reason that we care about journalism in these discussions in news media is in part um, because when journalists say, hey, we can be part of the solution too, that's not just professional ideology. Uh, that's well evidenced. Now. Um, the question I got was about the but, right? You know, what comes after that? But I think we wanted, I wanted to put that out there front and center first. Um, I think there are sort of three main ways in which sometimes uh, news media and, and journalism in the lay sense of the word, but not in the more rarefied sense of the word that, that, that Christoph just outlined, can get caught up in these things. Um, the first and most obvious one I won't dwell long on because that is media capture, right? So it's the, the point at which a, uh, an organization that purports to be an independent news media really is controlled by uh, exterior interests, whether that's the state or a political party or an oligarch or some group that uses that news media to advance their ideology or their interests, also sometimes in part by spreading false and misleading information. That issue is very real in much of Europe. Uh, it exists in some forms in most countries and in some countries it's a, it's a large share, unfortunately of the news media environment. Um, the, the two other uh, ways in which uh, news media can become part of this information problems I think are um, uh, a little bit less obvious in a way um, and, uh, and a bit harder to address head on uh, because they are less um, obviously uh, things that compromise the independence of journalists or the operations of news media. The first one is just a sort of standard editorial practice, which is that journalists, as the great media sociologist Gay Tuckman wrote almost 50 years ago, tend to regard it, uh, uh, the statement X set A 
as a fact, even if A is false, right? Dirty bomb. I have 102 MP supporting my candidacy. Um, mushroom cloud. Uh, you can think of many examples of this where you don't need to assume any bad faith or sloppy professional practice uh, on behalf of journalists and editors before key points in false and misleading narratives uh, can, can become part of mainstream news coverage from independent news media and professional journalists. Uh, so that's the first one, is that sort of business as usual editing, uh, and in particular an environment where, um, can I tell you a secret? Politicians know how this works, right? They're not idiots. Um, and they also know that if journalists and editors don't treat their statements as facts, they can accuse them of being partisan and biased, right? This is why Tuckman calls this the strategic ritual of objectivity. He said, she said, is a form of defense. This is the first one. Uh, the second one is, uh, I think we need to recognize that there are parts of what many news media organizations do, not so much in the newsrooms, um, but in parts of their overall package that uh, Sarah Soberaj called the outrage industry. Right? A, a fair amount of what news organizations publish is not news reporting. It's opinion, uh, or in the case of broadcast, it's sort of hosts who have guests and who drive narratives. And I think we've seen in the previous panel a, a number of reminders how a lot of various sort of moralizing discourses in our societies that tend to focus on vulnerable groups, migrants for example, um, or play to um, pre-existing stereotypes around say climate or religious minorities um, are, are things that some news organizations, uh, at least in parts of what they do, are actively promoting. Um, and this too, uh, I think it's, we have to recognize, can sometimes have the effect of leaving people misinformed, such as, for example, uh, the systematic correlation between following the news and vastly exaggerating the problems associated with migration in our societies. So media capture, um, he said, she said, forms of editorial practice, and then this sort of uh, soft belly of many media organization that really is not about news, uh, but about opinion. Thank you. And um, we've seen the, uh, the published conversation bits between Elon Musk um, and the CEO of uh, Axel Springer Group, um, the latter asking um, for far less content moderation. Um, so I'm interested to know, uh, Rasmus, because uh, I think you tweeted about this at the time, um, what do you think of calls for platforms uh, from some to restrict content moderation to, say, for example, only acting against illegal content? Um, well, um, I think we need to be very clear about what the consequences would be of, uh, of such a route, whether embraced by an individual company the way that uh, Mr. Dufner uh, suggested that Twitter would be run if uh, Musk bought it and let Dufner run it, uh, or whether it is instituted in law, as has been proposed in several states in the United States and was also proposed in Brazil, that uh, private companies were only allowed to engage in content moderation on content that was found to be clearly uh, illegal. Um, the, the clear consequence of that would be um, uh, far more shocking, offensive, and disturbing and false information uh, in public space. Um, and it's up to each of us as citizens uh, to form our own view on what balance we, we think is right in a free society uh, between um, uh, very strong protections around uh, expression, including, as the UN Special Rapporteur on Free Expression has often pointed out, protecting forms of expression that are shocking, offensive, disturbing, and not necessarily true, uh, versus uh, other considerations that are recognized as legitimate concerns in democratic societies, such as protecting people against hate speech or incitement to violence uh, or, or other forms uh, of speech that uh, you know, states will rarely act against, but private companies can act against uh, in the current environment uh, as long as one does not uh, resort to the um, position that Mr. Dufner has suggested for Twitter and that some politicians are suggesting should be forced upon uh, every technology company. Um, um, and I will just say that it's, um, it's probably easier to um, contemplate that situation um, calmly uh, if one is sort of a, a rich white guy who owns a large media organization, doesn't have to deal with all this bullshit uh, online, than if one is one of those communities that is often at the receiving end uh, of all this bullshit. 
Um, And just before, um, just before we turn to you, uh, Lou Bosch, uh, Christoph, I just wanted to ask uh, an additional question for you. Um, so we've seen that RSF um, has asked ARCOM to um, order the French TV satellite operator Utilsat to stop carrying uh, three Russian TV channels that are the spearhead of Kremlin's uh, war propaganda. Um, can you comment a little bit on this? Um, and whose responsibility is it to ensure that this doesn't happen? Yes, what we saw is that, uh, as everybody knows, there were uh, sanctions, economic sanctions against uh, propaganda media in Russia. We, in fact, in the past, we, we didn't uh, criticize um, the content of the decision. We would have really preferred, and, and we think that for the long term, those type of decisions are taken, um, uh, should be taken by uh, regulatory bodies, independent regulatory bodies, and not by political decisions. And, and this is really important for the legitimacy, even towards the whole world. Here. Um, we have a French satellite, uh, in fact, uh, an international satellite, but it is a French company um, uh, we, we, with a treaty, um, which, is, uh, which continues um, to uh, circulate, to broadcast uh, Russian TV propaganda media, really um, strong ones, I would say, uh, even dangerous ones, uh, which really circulate hate speech, um, uh, insight to, to, to war, um, and uh, toward Russia and toward also Ukrainian territories. And in the same time, real journalistic TV channels were removed by the decision of uh, Russian companies. So we are in, in this strange situation where um, a European satellite is, is um, it isn't takes the decision to remove journalistic, but it was de facto taken by others, and uh, whereas propaganda is, uh, continues to be circulated. And, and we do consider that it, it is legitimate that um, uh, democracies protect themselves and, and uh, take decisions to, to um, prevent fro uh, propaganda media to be uh, broadcasted. So we consider that a regulatory body should take measures, and the regulatory body which should take these measures is a French regulatory body, ARCOM. And that's why we are uh, working on it. But beyond this, um, we have to draw the consequences of the globalization of the information and communication space. Because our um, national safeguards, democratic safeguards, are like swept away. And we ha today have a sort of asymmetry between democracies and despotic regimes. Despotic regimes, they close behind um, walls, their own public spaces. They control news and information. Very often they launch uh, um, manipulation offensives. Whereas democracies are open and, um, and can be uh, fragilized internally uh, through the new information chaos, but also due to this, to this asymmetry. So we have to find also new legal systems to protect democracies, and we have put on the table a very concrete um, legal mechanism, a proposal, which is called a System for the Protection of Democratic Spaces based on a reciprocity mechanism. This reciprocity mechanism being itself based on um, international standards. Um, have a look, if you want, on our website. Um, for the future, to solve this question of an asymmetry between democracies and despotic regimes in the global in a globalized and digitalized information and communication space. But for the moment, um, this is, uh, the legal framework is enough uh, in our eyes uh, for ARCOM to really take decisions about Utelsat. Great, thank you. Um, so Lubosh, uh, finally I'd like, to, I'd like to turn to you um, to get the, the regulator's perspective. Um, so from, from your view, um, what do you think needs, uh, what do you need in terms of kind of processes uh, to address disinformation that's coming from uh, the media sector? Uh, well, uh, first of all, competencies. That's, that's the first thing that, that the regulators need. And uh, because, you know, it might, be, might not be generally known, but there are very few regulators in Europe, media regulators, that have uh, a competence over online and let alone disinformation, for example. So that's the first thing. 
Uh, and you know, you need to think hard about you know what, how how to frame the, the competencies, of course, because we have to still uh, keep in mind that disinformation, as such, are not illegal. So you can address some aspects of it, but you can't directly you know say that something like this is illegal and you can't do it. Everybody can lie. There may be some qualified lies that you know can uh, then become fraud, for example, or I don't know, they can accommodate illegal hate speech or something like that, but lies themselves are not illegal. So you have to be careful about the competencies, but you need them. Then of course you need the uh, expertise around that, which goes, I, I, sometimes people are, and politicians especially, are, are saying, okay, but do you have the expertise that we can give you the competencies to do something about it? Well, you know, I think the competency needs to go first, and then you can, you know, get expertise around that. Also with the budget that goes with, with the competencies, of course, and you need technical infrastructure, which again, you know, goes, goes after all of this. So if you have these things, then you can address the problem, and uh, in, you know, among media regulators in Europe, within ERGA, which is an you know, a, a organization that gathers all the media regulators in the EU and is an advisory body to the Commission, ERGA was tasked back in 2018-19 uh, in, uh, in monitoring the implementation of the Code of Practice on Disinformation, which is a self-regulatory voluntary code, uh, that the, the, the companies, platforms, and other companies uh, uh, devise together. And this is the way, I think, that we can call that we were given the competence for the first time. This is the way how we got the expertise. I think we can, we can probably safely say that there's a new generation of media regulators coming that already have the expertise around this information and actually know what to do. Now, on the member state level, we need to ask for the competencies. And we did that in Slovakia since August 1st. We have a new authority called Media uh, Council for Media Services, and we have now um, competencies over online, illegal content there, illegal hate speech, for example, but also disinformation. But we are addressing the disinformation in a way that we can analyze, we can talk to the platforms, for example, we can ask them to use their own community standards in, in a non-discriminatory manner, which means if they can do something in other countries, Slovakia is a small market, we understand that we are not in their focus, but now we can legally ask them to do the same thing uh, in our territory, for example. So, and, and we drafted these competencies uh, specifically with this in mind, to, to really uh, uh, target and address the problem in a direct way, but also in a way that is, I think, you know, that you, you don't need a, a big authority to do that. If, if you are targeting your competencies the right way, I think you can already make change. So yeah, so we're offering this to, to the others. Uh, we think that, that, that this might work and we are already on that. Great, and, and um, are you sort of optimistic? Do you think that the kind of existing um, tools and processes are kind of working better than they were? Or do you, th do you think there's kind of more to be done? Well, we're working on that. Uh, yeah, there, there are not that many tools that we can use. Uh, we have to be, you know, in, in terms of disinformation, for example, there are many, you know, initiatives on the member state level, also on the European level. You know, there are, um, at a governmental level, for example, you have these hybrid threat teams that are addressing individual uh, problems, individual content or campaigns that this content is used in. But from the regulatory perspective, from the systemic kind of perspective, there is not much you know, existing. What we have now is the Code of Practice on Disinformation, again, self-regulatory uh, initiative. Now it has a new iteration since June, and now in ERGA we are working with the European Commission and of course the signatories of the code to implement it. It's go much deeper than the first code. Uh, there is uh, much more transparency built into it. There are KPIs that need to be met with, with, with the implementation of the code. Now, in theory, this might really help now you know it's it's really um, you know we need to see how the implementation will go, but we are doing really the utmost to make that happen. Great, and we we heard in the um, the panel immediately after lunch um, we heard um, the the latest um, the latest research from EU Disinfo Lab on the doppelganger um, and the issues there around sort of authentic media being impersonated. Uh, by sort of by buying similar domain names and, and copying the design. Um, so as a regulator, um, what do you think can be done to address this? Um, and how can we make sure that the domain name industry as well as malicious actors are held to account? 
Well, it's a very interesting case, and, and I read the report with a great interest, and kudos to those who worked on it. Uh, well, uh, I'm, I'm not sure we can do something. No, currently we can't do anything about you know, it on the DNS level, that I think is, is quite clear. Now, can we devise a law rules uh, about that? I think probably that's imaginable. We have to think much harder about, about how, how this might be done, but you know, a kind of you know, rule about impersonation on that level might be thinkable. Uh, I'm not, not, not talking now about the technical possibilities there, but at least to address the actors that are acting this way, there may, might be a rule that just would prohibit that. Now, how, how will you track them? And I know that you know, uh, the, the, uh, those actors are not known even though, to those researchers who are researching this, so it might be hard. So, so, but you know, we, we will not solve that here and now. But on the, uh, in, on, on the you know, distributory level, on the distribution level, for example, a lot of you know media content now uh, people are of course receiving from social media, for example, and, and you know other distribution channel. But you can act there. You know the, the companies themselves, for example, uh, do have rules around impersonation. So, for example, if used uh, really efficiently, this might help at least on on on, on this level. We had a, and you no, know, and, and the thing is that they might not working be uh, not be working uh, that well. Because in Slovakia, for example, we had an impersonation problem. There was a site pretending to be Slovak police. Uh, there was a, a profile on, on, on Facebook. And it took, and the police were complaining to the Facebook, we were complaining to the Facebook, our government was complaining, even the president was complaining to, to the Facebook. It took two weeks to take that down. So, this, you know, there is a rule, they need to apply it, but much more efficiently. So, for example, this is the way you can address that. You have to, but we really focus on that and you know really apply your own rules efficiently. But again, this is about just about distribution. But I think it's a quite you know, great portion of how people are actually uh, connecting to these kind of media. So if you cut that out, you already I think you know helping the system a lot. Great, thank you. Um, I'm going to um, open it up to the floor for questions in, in a moment. Um, but just before I do that, I just wanted to um, just ask a, a final question, really, just to, after the, the, we've covered a, a broad range of topics already on the, on the panel, um, does anyone have um, anything that you'd like to add um, on what needs to be done to address disinformation in the media sector? So now we've, we're sort of at the end of our, end of our panel almost. Are there, are there any sort of final thoughts or additional insights that you have before we open it up to questions? Yes, please, please Lubov. Well, one thing is transparency is extremely important in this area. Transparency, uh, transparency about the rules that companies are applying now. And this is what the code of practice should be doing, of course, but, you know, just reiterate that. And then, and this goes also to you know, the, 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 your first question to me about, you know, what, what we need as regulators is access to data not just for the regulators, but also for the regulators and also for the researchers. This is something, you know, I, I understand that, you know, not all the data can be shared, but we have to meet with the platform somewhere in a, in a place that can work for both, both sides. But we need much more transparency here. Uh, that's, that's really something that I, I, I would really ask for. Great. Thank you. Uh, Christoph. Um, there are two types of strategies against disinformation. Target disinformation um, delete the bad or promote the good. Promote trustworthiness of news and information. The difficulty of the first strategy is that you have to identify this information, qualify it from the, a legal point of view, and remove it. And identify and qualify without taking discretionary decisions and sometimes even arbitrary decisions is very difficult. We do believe at Reporters Without Borders that the best strategy is the second one, and which is, in fact, the historical strategy that came after the, World War, the First World War in Europe. Find ways so that the people or institutions that are at the center of the public space implement some methods, implement some principles, and we will never succeed it should maybe not be an aim, to silence people who lie, people who just express hate or have obsessions about plots. They always existed. 
But in the past, they were on the sidelines, on the margins of the public space. At the center, through the, building, the historical building of Essex, through the professionalization of journalism, we succeeded to have mechanisms to promote, not exactly the good, it was the expression, but elements that allow to consider that there is some trustworthiness. And we have to get back with this logic, but to be very strong about this logic. So maybe uh, content, uh, content regulation is difficult, market regulation is very important, and to implement these types of market regulation, we need strong regulatory bodies implementing those strong democratic safeguards. But we need to, to fight for this. Thank you, and Rasmus. Yeah, I, I wholly second uh, both of those points. Um, um, I would only add um, two things. Uh, one is uh, just a reminder that the long ago, uh, rather grandly named high level expert group on online disinformation very clearly spelled out why uh, it is um, only on a very few and select circumstances that it is a good idea to resort to censorship in response to problems around disinformation why it's incredibly important that we hew to fundamental rights principles around uh, only resorting to that when it's prescribed by law, uh, when it protects specific legitimate values and interests, and when the uh, restriction is proportional to the documented threat at hand. And I would just say I think it's very, very important and has become very clear this, uh, this year why it's very important that we should demand at least the same level of transparency around uh, public authorities' uh, constant moderation as we do uh, around platforms content moderation, whether they do it directly uh, by telling other actors in society what they can and cannot carry, uh, or whether they do it uh, by deputizing platforms to act on their behalf in often very opaque ways. The second part I would just say is that, you know, it's obviously up to every citizen and elected official to make up their own minds about um, what they believe we ought to do collectively uh, in terms of, of collectively binding decisions and dedicating resources. I would only say I think there must be some citizens in Europe who are wondering how major European uh, politicians can keep talking about disinformation being a major challenge to European democracies, but never seem to be able to find any money to commit to actually addressing this major challenge to European democracies. So I think just from the point of a sort of democratic legitimacy, I would suggest either scaling up the commitment to meet the major challenge or scale down the assessment of the challenge if it isn't major enough to actually merit any investment. I'd now like to uh, open it up uh, to questions. Um, I think I see a sea of hands. Uh, gentleman at the back there, please. Hi, thank you so much for an uh, interesting talk. Um, and I completely agree with almost everything that Professor Kleis Nielsen has said. Uh, one question for the panel is, in the debate about censorship, um, for the last two, three years, we've seen a, an ecosystem of alternative platforms uh, becoming more and more independent. Uh, now you can basically have a, like, get funded on Patreon by, and keep your own disinformation channel running all by yourself without anyone actually being able to censure, censure you. So there is a much more resilient ecosystem. And it feels like that has produced, that, that, that is a result of intensive censorship during the pandemic. Um, is, are we missing a key point in that there, we're pushing audiences onto platforms that we do not have any influence over? That's for the whole panel. Who would like to start? Yeah. Thank you. No, well, uh, yes, we're doing that. That's, that's, that's quite clear with you know, the, the push against these, uh, uh, this phenomenon. Of course, you know, the, the actors who, you know, are you know peddling the disinformation are finding new ways uh, to communicate with their audience. The main thing is that you know, uh, and and we need you know to study this how large the audience then is you know because you you may just you know cut a large portion of their audience and those people because th those who are already you know the really uh, into that thing and are really looking specifically for that content well they will follow the influencers or you know the actors that's absolutely clear and i think you know that's that's a basic human freedom to do that but we need at least 
uh, try to not, not make that kind of content to be, you know, prevalent on, on, on the platforms that normal people are using. You know, not to create a, you know, the, the, the uh, you know, notion that, you know, this is probably true because half of my timeline in whatever platform I'm using, you know, is, is you know, have, have that content. So that would be my answer. So we, yeah, it, it's, it's happening, but maybe it's not a bad thing, but we need a research to, to see. Christoph. Um, I will, uh, I guess the, maybe the, there are some people from platforms in the, in the room, but for the moment there is an hypocrisy. Platforms say uh, they want to promote trustworthiness of news and information, but when, uh, we ask them to implement structural, systemic mechanism, they fully refuse. So we cannot accept that um, there is no integrity factor in the algorithmic indexation. There are a lot of criteria in the algorithmic indexation, but the way contents are produced, um, are the journalistic methods implemented or not, is not taken into account. And by the way, in the Digital Services Act, uh, promotion of trustworthiness of news and information is not mentioned, uh, and we do think that it is a pity. It is one of the commitments of the Code of Practice, offering, on a voluntary basis, trustworthiness indicators um, to uh, the people. The platforms did contribute to the negotiation of uh, this Code of Practice, just one sign this commitment. Just one. And, and they always say, we implement, we, we subsidize media. We cannot just accept that platforms say, we subsidize media, and it allows us just to impose our norms, and our norms are, just, are mainly related to our business models. This is not how our democracy works, and we have to impose again democratic principles to platforms. Christmas. Um, any more questions? Um, yes. Um, here, please. Thank you very much, first of all, for your interventions. This is Fernando Talforonda from the European Partnership for Democracy. My question is about the possibility of a media exemption in the EMFA. Uh, in the 10-point plan by uh, Peace, uh, Peace Prize laureate uh, Maria Ressa, there is the idea that in order to cut off the disinformation upstream, there needs to be no uh, media exemptions or carve-outs uh, in technology or uh, media legislation. Do you agree that there should be no media exemption in the EMFA, uh, like the versions of the media exemptions uh, are already rejected in the DSA legislative process, and well, to which maybe the commission proposal in Article 17 opens the door? I mean, I, I don't think my view on that as a, as a scientist I'm any more interesting or less interesting than any other citizens. Uh, I will only say that if there is to be an exemption, um, then someone needs to define what is a media. Uh, and logically, uh, that can only be done either by journalists and news media who historically have refused to do that because they believed that doing so was not in the interest uh, of a free and robust uh, public sphere, though I, I do recognize that the JGI is a, an attempt to evolve that line of thinking, or to have the state do it, and for very obvious reasons there's been even greater resistance to that. Uh, so if there is to be an exemption that it requires a definition, and the question is who gets to define. Um, and of, also, of course, uh, as a sort of an, uh, an extension of the point I made about Mr. Döpfner's position uh, on this matter, um, if there is an exemption, we need to recognize very clearly that there are numerous documented instances in which media organizations are part and parcel of misinformation problems, so such an exemption, of course, would have consequences. Rubosh. Thank you. Well, this is... Interesting question, and, and, and one that I'm, I'm and we in, in regulatory sector are uh, talking about quite a lot. And we had a conversation on Twitter the other day about in, in the DSA debate, uh, because when the first you know into the DSA debate, the, the media exemption was introduced. I I agreed with Maria Ressa that this is not a good idea. The thing is that I can imagine a version of media exemption that actually help 
But I think uh, in order to, to do that, it can't be for the recognition of who is media. It can't do you know, the, the legislation itself, because it can be only a definition somebody has to apply it. This is not a solution, nor uh, the state authority should do that. Uh, to recognize you know, what is journalism, media, media content. I think it should be probably organizations of the journalists themselves. And there's a, an idea that we are you know, talking about with uh, Martin Husovets, which is a, 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 uh, a researcher at the London School of Economics. And he has this idea about content, uh, trusted content creators. Now, a kind of you know, trusted flaggers in the DSA, that you can create a system where you can have a recognition uh, of, of content that you know, is trustworthy, and you can translate that kind of label uh, on the platforms and, and to the users, and for, for which you can probably use a kind of procedural exemption, for example, that, that the platforms can't do something like take down that content you know, immediately, that you have to go through some kind of procedure. So something like this, I can't go very deep into that, but I think something like this could be workable, and JTI, for example, might be, might be a way how to implement it. Now, there may be various reasons for various kind of content for recognition of this content as trustworthy, and then connect it to the idea of media exemption. Now, it is quite confusing calling what is now in MFA uh, the media exemption because it's very different from what we've been talking about in the context of DSA. I know that platforms are talking about it as must carry, for example, which is again misleading because must carry in the old world was something entirely different. So probably it would be useful to, to, to create a new word for that. But yes, I, I can imagine something like that, but in, in a very, uh, well, how to say it, uh, very, you know, you have to think about carefully how to implement that, but never talk about blank, uh, you, know, the, 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 you know, like uh, the media exemption to entirely uh, exempt the media from any kind of counter moderation on the platforms. I think that might be detrimental in, you know, in this manner as, as, as Maria Ressa was, was talking about. Thank you. Christoph. Uh, I would avoid regarding this topic uh, uh, to um, black on white conversation or yes or no, uh, because in f this debate is very polarized. And we could consider that we have some people saying we need a media exemption, but for all the guys or entities who pretend to be media or journalistic media, no need to prove it. So it will allow um, uh, really um, media outlets to enjoy this exemption, even if they are not journalistic at all. And on the other side, you could you have another position which uh, can be no media exemption, but in fact, in, in that case, uh, you do not really have a consideration for the specificities of journalistic work and even for the responsibilities of, of journalism. And journalism is clearly about rights and duties, and duties are as important as rights. And if you have an edi editorial responsibility, a legal responsibility, if you prove that you exercise this responsibility, that you implement rules. In fact, at the end, I think that all of us, we consider that, yes, there should be some, uh, if there is public funding, or if there, is some, there should be some incentive. So maybe there should be a sort of media exception or exemption. So the question is more, what could we do? And I, I think that people who are against and people who are in favor of it could speak together, and instead of saying we are uh, in favor or not, what should we do and how do we really support the social function of journalism and, and uh, how do we implement uh, the rights and duties and um, uh, do we accept that if you exercise a certain level of responsibilities in the public uh, space, in the information and communication space, it gives you some incentives. And which type? Which is another discussion. Thank you very much. I think we've... Um We've got time for one more question. <laughs> the unenviable task of working out who to pick. Um, I'm going to go over to this side because I haven't chosen anyone from this side. Um, and this gentleman here at the front. Thanks a lot. This is also for the for the full panel. Some of the um, very interesting initiatives that have gone into self-regulation have to do with the very necessary exercise of transparency from media companies in the sense of being able to know what kind of connections are there, real ownership, and all that. But what uh, really keeps me up at night is the possibility of a media company being able to check every box in the in terms of transparency of ownership. 
an organizational structure and is still being a consistent and permanent uh, vehicle for this information. So is there, is there any reasonable way that you can think of that this could be, that there, that there will be some, I don't know, society-wide quality control on media in the sense of, you know, if, if you mess up, you correct yourself, that goes beyond a structural information and, and transparency of ownership and that kind of more uh, corporate-like uh, conditions. Thank you. Who would like to start? Lubos. Uh, thank you very much. Well, um, I will come back to the idea that uh, I was just talking about, that I, I think, you know, you can have a kind of recognition for the media coming from the peers, you know, in, in the system. Because, uh, you know, if, if you are thinking about just legal way to do something, you can never go, you know, deeper than, you know, the, the freedom, uh, uh, interests and, and, and rights, you know, of, of those involved, you know, allow you. So, for example, you know, uh, in, in terms of checking the box for, for transparency on the ownership, you can only go, you know, so far. So I think if we have organizations, and, and I, I know that they're already existing, but, you know, the organization, uh, organizations that can vouch for their members that are following the procedures that Christo was talking about, you know, editorial procedures, then, you know, you can make those organizations, you know, uh, recognize and give them the label of, of kind of trustworthy content. You know, you, you need to somehow find a way how to recognize those that are really trustworthy in what, in what they're doing. Again, it's not about content, about, about you know, it's a procedural question whether they they're, have, have their, those editorial processes there. And I think, you know, this is probably the way to do that. But you, ha you have to have a basic legal level but then about that you need to have another structure where peers in the system, for example, journalists for the journalists, but they may be, I don't know, influencer for influencers, you know, can vouch for, you know, you know in, in, for the entire community that they are abiding by some kind of rules and applying that in a transparent manner and, and so on. And you can then build the recognition of quality content or trustworthy content probably is a better word for that uh, in, in the system. So probably that, that would be my answer to this. Christoph? Uh, I think that um, assessments by peers can be considered on that um, uh, journalists or newsrooms, they can contribute to make some assessments on, on facts, on the content. But if you want really an assessment on the processes, journalists or newsrooms are not good in doing this. That's not their job. They don't know this. So for this, you know, entities, was, it's a job to do this even in other sectors. And that's the case of the certification market. Um, certification um, is a process that is governed in Europe by a EU directive. And in all our countries in Europe, we have certifier of certifiers. And certifiers, they do work, for, for instance, on how planes are produced. This is so different from news and information. But you enter into planes and you fly because you know that planes are produced in a um, secured way, and that some processes are implemented. And in fact, those companies, they can do the same um, for um, news and information processes, because that's about verification between a reference, which is a standard, <laughs> a EU standard, and the processes in a company. Uh, just those companies have to take this market and develop uh, their skills on it. And, and uh, we started this work, and I have to say that in a very, um, it's a question of weeks, in a very short term, um, the certification market for the Journalism Trust Initiative will be opened in uh, 33 European countries. And then the implementation with the incentives can, can come. And... Uh, Already, uh, media outlets were pre-certified by, by a private company uh, um, um, uh, in, in different uh, countries in, in Europe. So this process is starting, and there is an ex existing framework which we can clearly use with people who have the skills for this and the methods, and where we have a guarantee through the certifi certifier of certifiers. Maybe it's a bit complicated, but uh, we can explain more if uh, you want. And Rasmus, the last word is yours. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I, I would say that if I think about this from a citizen point of view, like what, what would citizens want from such a system, 
it would have to be a system that would regularly draw distinctions between some journalists and other journalists, some news publishers and other news publishers, and would revise those dis distinctions on a regular basis so that some people would fall out and some entities would fall out and others would enter. Um, that, that, I think, is what citizens would want from such a system. Um, I don't think it's cynical to say that the only such system that existing news publishers are going to be open to is one in which they recognize all of them forever as news publishers. I, I mean, it's just hard to imagine an industry that will say, we will embrace a system by which 25% of our members are no longer part of our industry. And similarly with journalists, uh, I, I think it's hard to see, uh, I mean, it varies from country to country, but in a lot of Euro countries in, Euro in the European Union, many people who are members of journalist unions are no longer working journalists, right? They work in PR, they work as comms professionals, uh, they work for political parties. There's nothing wrong with that, that's not a judgment. I'm just saying, you know, from a citizen's point of view, surely the point would be a distinction that makes a difference, not just, uh, you know, a gold star that's handed out to everybody. Um, and and I, I, I have to say, I struggle to see a, a form that can take that doesn't involve, oh, but you forgot to fill out form 4D uh, and submit it to the certifier or certificates. Uh, so, you know, you lost your license for a year. Um, and, and maybe such a system could be up. I think the work that's gone into JTI is very, very uh, 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 profound and interesting and nuanced work. But I, I will say that from the point of view of what citizens, I think, will expect and what the industry and the profession is likely to embrace, uh, I think there is still some way to go before it's uh, possible to see something that would be both effective and legitimate. Great. Thank you. Thank you for your questions. Um, and I'd like to ask you to join me in thanking our excellent panel. Thank you. Thank you.